Good evening. My apologies for coming in and rushing um, and not being here to welcome and greet you all when you came in the door. Had a little fire I had to put out, but it's taken care of. Um, and so, again, I apologize. So for those who do not know me, I think everybody knows me by now, I'm Dr. J, or Juliana Mosley is my real name. Students call me Dr. J. And I am the College Officer for Diversity and Inclusion. Welcome to our Native American Heritage Month program, which is under the Office of Diversity and Inclusion's Cultural Awareness Series um, that I started when I got here last year. Unfortunately, last year, we were not able to do a Native American Heritage Program had great intentions, tried to actually book a lecture, it did not work out, and I felt really bad because this is never a month that I want to miss. Um, but we weren't able to pull it off last year. But this year, um, we were definitely able to do that. I'm very grateful for our speaker and even equally grateful to Sister Kathy Nerney, who suggested her. She remembered her from when she was here as a student. And so I'm very glad that we're able to do that um, on today. And so, of course, we have Native American Heritage Month, which is the month of November. It started in 1990 under President George H.W. Bush, and um, it was basically a continuation of what had started in this country as far back as 1916 with the very first American Indian Day. Um, that was the second Saturday of May um, in the state of New York, actually. So there was a proposal for it to be at a national level, but New York was the first one to get on board, and then actually what happened was a couple of states at a time would just kind of join into um, this process. And so often, many of us do not have a connection, um, a hardcore bloodline connection to our Native American um, indigenous people. Many of us claim, um, oh, I've got, you know, Native American in my family, and I'm from this, my people are from this nation, and we do a lot of claiming. But many of us, when we actually go back, don't have the bloodlines that we think that we have. And even when we do, we haven't been raised in the true tradition of culture um, and of the people, of language. And so there's a, oftentimes this disconnect with indigenous people. And so as a result of that, we have a tendency to make up things, right? So we put into play our own stories or our own voice about Native people. And so our speaker today is really going to challenge us to not do that um, and to truly listen to the voice of the people themselves. And so having said that, I hope that you will get something um, from this lecture in terms of increased knowledge, in terms of um, being able to connect sometimes with a forgotten or overlooked culture and population, which if it wasn't for them, none of us would be. So having said that, Sister Kathy Nerney, if you will come and do the honors of introducing our guest, please. Well, thank you for being here, everyone. It really is um, an honor for me to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Marlene Lang. So Dr. Lang is an assistant professor of religious studies at Mount St. Joseph University in Cincinnati, Ohio. But before Marlene ended up in Cincinnati, Ohio, she was a student here. So she's an alum of Chestnut Hill College. She entered our graduate program in holistic spirituality in 2009. And I had the great honor of teaching Marlene. And um, after graduation, uh, from which uh, Marlene was absolutely passionate about putting her faith um, in dialogue with social transformation. So what does it mean to be a person of faith, a really spiritually grounded person, and also feel a commitment to help change our world? Well, that's Marlene's passion. And I look at some of you and know you have that same passion. So uh, hopefully you may pursue some of the roads that Marlene did. Before Marlene started studying here, she was a very successful journalist. And she discovered in her journalism that she was observing and reporting on important events, especially justice issues that she was so passionate about. But she could only report on them. She was an observer of them. 
She wanted to be in a position where she could help change the injustices that she saw. And so her interest in spirituality and theology comes from this desire to change injustice when she recognizes it. And so Marlene went to study for a PhD in pastoral theology at St. Thomas University in Miami, isn't it? In Florida. And um, I again had the great privilege of being on Marlene's dissertation committee. So I got to read her research on the topic you're going to listen and learn so much from today. I learned so much from my privileged uh, vantage point of being a reader of Marlene's dissertation. So, white lament matters. So this is a recommendation that Marlene will make for cultural healing. And it's a cultural healing that, as um, Dr. J um, was suggesting, we all need because we have been complicit, even in subtle ways, of the injustices that our indigenous First Nation people have experienced all these centuries. And so what Marlene will offer us is a methodology that she used, which is deliberate and respectful listening to the voices of the Native American people who have not been listened to. And so what you will hear from Marlene today is not so much that she wants to talk about what she learned as she listened, but she wants to share with us how she listened, how she came to learn. And I think this need for deep, respectful, humble listening is needed in all the cultural conversations that we have today. So we're going to be listening to Marlene tell us how to listen. Doesn't that sound important? So uh, please join me in welcoming Dr. Marlene Lang as she talks about white lament matters. down. That was a very nice introduction. Um, I think I was the worst listener ever. Um, as a journalist one time, I was actually um, pulled aside by my boss and told I needed to stop inter I needed to stop interrupting people. That's how, okay, there we go. As a journalist, my publisher, my boss, told me you interrupt people a lot. So I'm just going to preface this with saying uh, learning to listen wasn't something that's ever come to me naturally. Um, my, my brain runs fast. I get excited about what's happening and I just start talking and um, I think we all do too much of that. We think what we have to say and what we're thinking about is so important. Um, and it is, but so is what the other people are saying. So with that, I'm going to begin here. Um, and by the end, you'll understand why I called this talk White Lament Matters. Um, Indian identity. Um, this is an inquiry as old as I am. Uh, from my very earliest memories, I was told I'm Indian because my father is. Um, here's a picture of me with my daddy. You can tell by that picture how old I must be. <laughs> um, it's been through a lot. Um, but identity is a question we all have to answer. Um, it's about who we are. It's about who we're told we are. And in different ways, we have to sort things out and answer these questions. Um, so as Sister Nierney, um explained, uh, I was a journalist before I did this. Um, before I went on to study spirituality and theology. Um, and in an interview about this talk, um, and often just in life, I get asked, how did you go from journalism to this? And as, uh, as was noted a little bit here, um, my work was just following injustices on parade. That's how I 
like to describe it. Um, I covered prisons and I discovered that we were using people um, in ways that are really human rights violations um, for the purposes of making money. Uh, I had no clue. Um, I had an experience of seeing, covering courts and seeing what happens in our criminal justice system. Uh, a woman with two little boys um, escorted out of a courtroom because her, I assumed husband, had been sentenced to eight years in prison for a drug offense. And the bailiffs took her out and the little boys looked confused and there's their father standing up in front. And this was a real moment um, of uh, questioning what my life work would be. So. Um, it was a long trail toward this. Um, so after prayerful consideration um, of what my career path would be, I came to a graduate open house right in this room, um, and I decided this was where I belonged. Um, I said, I want to come here. So um, that's what I did. Am I an Indian? I hope no one here is disappointed in my degree of Indianness. <laughs> Um, I met my grandfather, Irvin Andrew Royce, when I was six years old, um, my father's father. We drove an hour and a half from where I lived to the Menominee Nation Reservation. He lived on a little piece of the Menominee Reservation that was set aside for the Stockbridge Munsee Band of Mohegan Indians because they had nowhere to go when they were uh, removed from Massachusetts. That's where my grandfather lived. Um, I always say he looked just like my father, but he was brown, okay? Um, I thought I was Indian. I mean, I didn't know what it meant, but that was this. Uh, nope, not really, okay? It was a bit of an um, existential crisis, okay? Um, and how did I get on this path of discovering that maybe I'm not Indian by someone else's definition. Um, what does that mean? What do I do with my ancestry? Um, Native Americans, um, I learned, um, they tend to identify through their tribal affiliation. Um, and you'll see in my PowerPoint um, some of the sources I'm going to uh, refer to in parentheses after their name, it will say the tribe that they belong to. That means they are an enrolled member of that tribe. Um, they stress the importance of having grown up in a tribal community um, as part of identity. Um, so they use that tribal name. They'll say, I am Osaji, or I am Og Oglala Sioux, or some, you know, whichever they are. That is their preferred way to identify. Um, and I'm not on a tribal role because my um, grandmother didn't want to marry the uh, Native American who was my grandfather. So the, his, your history just is your fate, um, the decisions your parents and grandparents make. So um, tribal communities define themselves and they set a boundary. That definition of Native identity is the boundary they have set. Um, and I have to respect that. Um, Native Americans have lost everything and we don't get to say that they also um, have to be subject to our definition. This is what I learned. Um, so I took my place outside the circle that they had drawn, um, knowing that there was a larger circle to which we all belong and this is okay. Um, but it wasn't easy. Um, and uh, I'm gonna go into that a little bit more. So out of respect for my ancestry, and that's all it is, it's ancestry, um, even if unacknowledged, um, that respect demanded that I listen. So where this all left me was just asking, what does it mean to be Native American? Um, you know, some of my um, white friends really wonder, you know, they get kind of angry at this. Of course you're Indian, your grandfather's Indian, you know. I'm not even like an Elizabeth Warren case where it was just a story 10 generations back. It is my grandfather. Um, I look like him, okay. Um, 
And, uh, you know, so, so there's this kind of indignation about it, which, of course, I never really felt that. I just sort of felt left out. Um, where do I fit? I'm on the outside of this community. Um, so I came to the realization that there was a lot I did not understand. Um, and this became the topic of my dissertation. Um, I started out wanting to study the theology of um, uh, Native American women who practice both Christianity and their Native religions. I thought that was great. No one wanted to work with me in the communities um, because they don't trust white people. They don't trust academics coming in and studying them. Um, and it takes many, many years to form those kind of trusting relationships. And of course, I didn't have many, many years to do that. Um, so I started just reading and listening to what um, Native Americans were publishing out there. So when I talk about my work, um, my frequently asked questions are, um, why are you calling them Indians? Is there anyone here who's thinking that? Why is she referring to them as Indians? Don't you know that's a historical error made by white people, right? I first thought that when I started reading. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's a very good question. Um, isn't that an insult? At, as I started doing my reading, I discovered many of the books written by Native American authors refer to themselves as American Indians or Indians. They do. Like, you know, yes, of course it was an error, but that's what we call ourselves. So many say that's fine, we're fine. I heard a speaker when I was an undergraduate at Millersville University, um, a native uh, dance group came and he spoke afterwards and said the same thing. We're okay with that, many are. I can't speak for everybody, but that's, that's what I read. This is what they're saying in their books. So um, aren't they offended by being called Native American? Because they're indigenous, they're not really, you know, we're assigning that, right? They said no. Um, American identity was forced on us, but nevertheless, we are Americans. Um, they take a lot of pride in how many of their people have served in the, the armed forces. Any reservation you go to, any powwow, any of their events, they've got, they feature their, their military service. They're very proud of that. They're proud to be American. So that's your answer to that. What about First Nations? What about it? Um, that's, that's what Canada calls their indigenous peoples. Okay, that's a Canadian use. Um, most of my sources were uh, within the United States. That was part of how I narrowed my research. Um, so um, I didn't use it. I decided I was going to um, refer to Native Americans the way they refer to themselves. It was part of my methodology of respectful listening. Um, so, as I said, they'll go by their names usually. The Creek, Ojibwe, Oneida, Fox, their tribal affiliation um, is the preferred method, okay? So, um, listening to these voices, and when I say listening, what I mean is I read what they wrote, I looked at digital publications uh, that young Native Americans are putting out there on YouTube and other places, um, and, uh, some were uh, films, uh, photography, other art. Um, so I said, well, you know, what, what are, what's out there? What are the expressions? What do Native American people have to say about themselves? Because obviously I don't get it. Uh, and I was very, um, I, the fact that I was in this, you know, little uh, identity crisis of my own, um, it tied me emotionally to this question. I think it made me a better researcher and a better listener once I got over feeling sad about it. Okay, So uh, what I discovered very quickly was the Native American voices were angry. Some of it was hard to hear. Okay, um, And one of the biggest reasons that they were angry was because no one was listening to what they were saying. Um, I found this early on. Uh, we will see, we'll see a couple things from this. This um, elder, native elder, um, Vine Deloria Jr., he died in 2006. Um, he's considered a grandfather to Native American scholars. 
he's beloved by them. Um, he wrote in 1969 in a work called Custer Died for Your Sins, an Indian manifesto. Um, rarely does anyone ask an Indian what he thinks about the modern world. So assured is modern man that he has absolute control of himself and his society that there's never any question what Indian, about what Indians are moving toward that great and blessed land of suburban America. Indians were just the new market share. Um, it appears to many Indians that someday soon the modern world will be ready to understand itself and perhaps the Indian people. This is one of his milder quotes. Um, scathing is how I would call it. Um, another very good essay from him um, is titled, We Talk, You Listen. He just said, it's time for you all to be quiet and listen to what we have to say. Okay. Um, so remember that name if you're interested in learning more about Native Americans, um, who they are, what they have to say for themselves. Look up Vine Deloria Jr. It's a good place to start. His, prop, his most famous work is called God is Red. Ah. Um, Kimberly Rapolo. She is uh, a teacher, uh, PhD, a professor, um, and there's her tribal heritage. She lists with her name. Racism against Native Amer or, uh, American Indians, here she is, re self-referring as American Indian, is so intrinsically part of America's political mythology, the truth a, a group of people agrees to believe about itself, that without Without it, this country would have to do something it has never done, face colonial guilt. This is the message that's out there. It's, it's about denial. It's about the glossed over history of our country. And I know um, we've heard a lot about this. Um, there are, there's speakers out there, books being written in it related to um, our, our past of slavery. Um, you don't hear as much about our past relationship with natives, Native Americans. Um, and it's just as horrible. Uh, Rapolo challenges her students. It's a good passage in her book. She challenges her students to tell her who's holding the special of the day sign at Applebee's, which I could not find a picture of. But it's a cigar store Indian. The cigar store Indian is an example of the frozen, stereotyped image of Native Americans. Um, and uh, it's very offensive to Native Americans. Um, why? Um, because it impinges on their own identity, their own struggle to decide who they are, to understand themselves. Um, one of the best uh, sources I had beautiful book uh, called Genocide of the Mind, New Native American Writing. There, They are self-referencing. This, this anthology is a response to modern day Native people becoming more and more disgruntled with spurious representations. Okay. Um, Mary Jo Moore edited that. Um, it's a wonderful source. This is one of the big messages coming out of it. A lot of these writers um, had never been published before, young people. Um, and if you really want to hear the angry voice, here it is. Um, Roxanne Dunbar-Ortiz, she is a historian. This book, which I, I borrowed these um, cover titles from Goodreads, uh, she spent six years putting this book together. Um, she, I just pulled a couple examples. Uh, she calls President Andrew Jackson out for his career building through genocide, refers to white squatters, not settlers, um, on Indian land, and reminds readers of the brutal war of annihilation of the Muscogee Nation. So she's not mincing words. Um, and one of the big messages from the scholars is the language, the way language glosses over the history. Um, and they come right out with it um, and call it what it is. And I think she's, uh, she's one of the most 
vocal as far as the language um, uh, refusing to just just be nice and, and to make it all sound okay. Um, another one, um, he even, um, George Tinker, even um, changes punctuation, right down to punctuation. I'm not going to capitalize Christian and Western, things like that. Um, so you get used to it when you're reading his work. Um, but George Tinker, uh, just this spring, retired um, from the Iliff School of Theology, where he was a professor. Um, and he is uh, a Lutheran pastor, uh, a professor, and he's a spiritual leader of um, Native Americans in Colorado. Um, so here's a quote. Um, he talks about in the post-Civil War era, the debate in American newspapers in the East over uh, was over the humanity of the Indian and how to proceed with Western expansion. But he said it was really just a debate over whether we will justify genocide or where, whether we'll be more liberal and just civilize the Indian and basically commit cultural genocide. That's what was going on. Um, so Tinker is, um, he, he's an excellent scholar, but his voice, again, the first time you read it, it's, it's hard to listen to. Um, he calls out, um, you know, he, he understands and acknowledges the good intent of missionaries, but he goes right, he goes right for the juggler of, um, of the gospel message um, being twisted and distorted and that he says we mistook Western civilization for the gospel. And that's what we did and we came and brought that to the Native Americans. Um, so, George Tinker. And the young people, uh, also angry but funny as well. Um, these guys are a comedy troupe. There's two others. Um, this is a, a photo I found I could use. It was in a, a newspaper in South Dakota. Um, the 1491s, they call themselves. Um, I strongly suggest go on YouTube, look them up. They are very funny. Um, from the left on, uh, Bobby Wilson, Dallas Goldtooth, and Ryan Red, uh, Redcorn. And they are, in this photo, they went to a school in uh, South Dakota to a D.A.R.E. graduation. Um, they're very, um, not only funny, but they, um, do good work, they're concerned, they're socially active. Um, I have embedded this video. Is there a way we can play that quickly, Greg? Okay. If you don't know who Edward Curtis is, he's, uh, um, he's a photographer. Um, he was funded, I believe, by the Carnegie Institute, um, and he photographed Native Americans as a vanishing people. Um, you know, in the last of what we consider the old ways. Um, so their Native Americans are often critical of his work um, because no one's smiling in it. Ryan Redcorn um, in the blue hat there, and you're saying, who is that white guy? He's Osaji, um, and he's a photographer, and uh, he did a wonderful video himself um, poking fun of photography of Indians um, and how they're never smiling and he does his own work showing them smiling. So, uh, so this is a little taste of Indian humor, uh, Native Americans. But these guys are also, okay, it's not clicking, um, are also activists and they, they were at the um, opening of the uh, Smithsonian Native Amer Museum of the Native American. Um, and this is just a blog post um, that Dallas Goldtooth does because he's a leader in the water protector movement um, that's ongoing. And I know we heard a lot about that in 2016. Um, it's still going on. Their people are still facing court dates because many of them were arrested. Um, and they say, we're not protesters. We are trying to protect the water because water is life. That's their message. So these guys are not just funny, um, just so you know. Um, 
It doesn't feel good to watch stuff like that um, and not be the good people of the world. We want to be. Um, there's a lot of talk right now, and I came across this book that was just published. Um, covers a, a lot of the categories I have from a different approach. Um, called White Fragility, Why It's So Hard for White People to Talk About Racism. And I, I had to identify that this is kind of what I was experiencing when I went through this whole identity thing and said, you know, I think I'm Indian. What is the problem and why are these people so angry about it? Um, I had to sit with that. Um, so that's where I'm going to go with this. Um, and uh, some of Robin DiAngelo's um, categories, questions, she, she produces kind of a profile of the fragile white person um, who thinks of themselves as the exception. Um, it's a very good work. She, she goes very deep into de deconstruction, deconstructing um, the way we think about race. Um, and I had to ask myself, was I the person who thought I got it but by that very thought maybe prove that I wasn't, that I didn't. Um, and yet, ah, right? The very thought of that word, white fragility. Um, my word when I was writing my dissertation was white whining, and I was referring to myself. Um, but it's this moment of screaming and saying, well, how do we be the good people of the world because I want to be? What do we do with that? Um, I answered my own question in the process of doing my research and writing. Um, and so now I'm getting to my, you know, my method, my recommendation, um, and how I went through that. Um, I feel like I was prepared for this work um, in the graduate program here in spirituality um, because it taught me a lot about just listening to our own interior responses and um, and being aware of that and sitting with discomfort that was a big a big principle um, so I've taken a couple of the important um, kind of the concluding thoughts I had I'm just going to read this I found myself blocked while reading accounts of removal of indigenous peoples, the death and suffering along the Trail of Tears, allotment and legislative theft of their land, the cultural genocide by means of kidnapping their children, erasing their language, outlawing their spiritual practices. Each time I sat before my computer, amid the pile of books and papers that describe this history, this American Holocaust, I was frozen. I felt sick to my stomach. My aversion to writing an academic account was so great, I repeatedly got up and walked away from it. Or I sat and stared. For weeks, I accomplished nothing. This was after doing the chapter on the history, giving just the important background stuff so that we would understand what the Native uh, Americans today are saying. It left me numb. I had read all of these books. I had seen films showing the story. I had walked on Indian reservations. My brother was a pastor on the Lac de Flambeau Reservation in northern Wisconsin for eight years, and I spent summers up there. Um, I knew some of the horrific truth, and now I was faced with writing about it, reflecting on it, um, and something in me was refusing. This is a part of listening to ourself, to, to something inside us. I struggled through a discernment process. What is blocking me? Am I pushing my soul into something it opposes? Am I not listening? What is this resistance to writing telling me? And as importantly as anything else, I prayed. I asked why the fight with my own inner self? I am not often a soul at war with myself or with God. I love and I reverence both, and at great personal cost. What in me is resisting this work? So this was where I had a change in my understanding. Um, 
but it, it was precipitated with just sitting here with really uncomfortable feelings that I did not understand, that I didn't know what to do with. Plus, I had to finish the dissertation. <laughs> That's where the praying came in. I have to finish this. And I'm going to give you a principle here. Who is this Native American? That's my sister. Sometimes when you can't answer a question about yourself, listen to your soul friends, the people who know you very well, who understand you, who care about you, who are themselves spiritual. Listen to them. Um, they see you from outside yourself, and it's easier than meditation. Meditate, oh, I need to you know, get into this Buddhist um, place of seeing myself from outside myself. No, uh, your sister knows, okay? It's true, um, that, you know, the people we live with, they're like, really? Um, you didn't know that about yourself? No. <laughs> so, listen to your soul friends. Um, Here's what my sister said to me as I was pacing around, pulling my hair out, wondering why I couldn't write anything. How can you stand to be immersed in that subject? It's so horrible. Um, this person, my sister, is herself very bold. She's not someone who shies away from hard truth. Um, I could not, she said, I could not even finish reading Bury My Heart at Wounded Knee very famous work of the history of Native American relations with the United States. I recalled, I also had solved somewhere in the last half of that book by Dee Brown, the sadness of history was overwhelming and I could not long sit in it. Maybe as a scholar I had learned to respond like a trauma nurse, steeling myself against the corporal horror in order to accomplish a necessary task. I think I learned that as a journalist first. Um, interviewing the widow of a black man who had been shot in a parking lot, you know. The next morning they send you over to interview the widow. Really? When I think about that, um, that wasn't right. Um, so Wounded Knee, famous massacre December 29th, 1890, it's considered the end of the Indian Wars. This is why I was frozen. Um, did you know we had mass graves of Native Americans buried in mass graves? Whole villages just shot, women, children, old people, everyone. Yes, and we have pictures. Thank goodness there was photography then. This picture on the right is very famous. Um, in the Wounded Knee Massacre, you'll see accounts of anywhere from 150 to 300 killed. 50% difference or 100% difference um, in the reporting. It was on December 29th. They went, you know, they went in um, and they killed uh, an entire village, really. and. The people were left for, it was too cold to go get the bodies, it's South Dakota. Um, and so they left them there till spring and there are photos of the bodies and this one is very famous of a person who was shot and frozen, sat there all winter. This is the stuff. Um, so Peter Nabokov, who did a wonderful job of collecting um, primary source Native American history. Um, writes, in the spring of 1865, the bodies left frozen in Sand Creek were thawing. A United States senator visited Sand Creek in the Colorado Territory. He picked up the jawbone of an Indian child whose milk teeth had not been shed. That means it's a baby, um, a toddler. The youngster was among 200 Cayenne Indians whose camp was flying an American flag when they were killed the previous autumn by U.S. soldiers. So this is where the word lament comes into my presentation and my work. Um, 
Grim stories had filled the books and papers piled on my desk, and I had to pause in reverent memory of that one Cain child and all the others. Their spirit was demanding it of me, and until I did, I was frozen with them. How could I imagine a work that I hoped would bring healing to my own culture's spiritual sickness and not anticipate that I would have to endure a close-up, sickening encounter with the horrors that had established <clears throat> the present condition? The grisly details of human history and the sickness which, with, with which my body had responded, they were a block, a dam, that would have to be broken. So in my aversion, to this, my human resistance to looking on slain infants, though it seemed impenetrable as a wall that could not be scaled, I prayed and I began to cry. I just had to cry. That's how I finished my dissertation. Um, I looked at the hard, horrible truth of it and I let myself cry. And it was a gift, I have to say it was a gift that I was able to cry about this. So why white lament? Um, the understanding of the racial question, and I'm quoting Vine Deloria Jr. again, who showed up in that Indian store video we watched. Um, it does not ultimately involve either blacks or Indians. It involves the white man himself. You have to pardon his sexist language. He's writing in 1969 here, where he refers to all people as man. Um, he must examine his past. He must face the problem he created within himself and within others. The white man must no longer project his fears and insecurities onto other groups, races, and countries. Before the white man can relate to others, he must forego the pleasure of defining them. So he's saying the answer to the racism problem is the white man himself going inside. He's saying this. Um, so that's why I say white lament matters. Um, when the dam broke, I realized that weeping and tears were necessary to both the immediate question of why I was blocked and to the larger question of healing and reconciliation that had led me into this work. I had to weep to continue. And as you might guess, um, I'm recommending that we look at the history and look at it and let ourselves feel this and maybe even cry about it. Um, so listening to what Native Americans are saying leads to weeping. If you've heard, if you've gotten this, you might cry. It's that bad. Um, if I did not weep myself as an academic, as a white American, as a Christian, as a person with a native grandfather, as a human being, I could not continue and form any recommendation for action by others. The conclusion that arose, what I came to is, I recommend tears. I recommend tears. And our work is to find our way to that. So who's brave? That's what I say. I discovered, I, I teach social justice at Mount St. Joseph uh, University. And um, I, this week I was showing um, a TED talk by Brian Stevenson. Maybe some of you know who he is. He talks about, he's a civil rights activist attorney. Um, and he, he uses that. He says, who, we have to be really brave to do this work. Now, he's talking as an African-American man who's fighting injustices, particularly um, juvenile criminal justice issues. But we, who are privileged white people, have to be brave to look at this. Um, it takes being brave with our own offended feelings and our fragility as Robin DiAngelo was using the word, we've got to be brave. We've got to be brave to look at what's really going on. So I have a starter list I, I made up of if someone wanted to know 
about this work. Um, wanted to know what Native Americans are saying, wanted to know about the history. Um, I'm gonna put this PowerPoint on my blog um, and I'm gonna give it to the department here. So you can go back if you want to look, like where would I even start? Well, go, go at, on YouTube tonight after this and look up the 1491s, they're very funny. But you'll also see the angry stuff. Um, or go watch a movie. So I've got a list of movies for you that you can go and look at. Um, Bury My Heart at Wounded Knee. It's very Hollywoodized. It's not as probably terrible as things really were, but it's a good place to start. It's based on D. Brown's book, who was, um, he was a, a tremendous historian, a scholar of this history. Um, that's a good place to start. I've shown that to students and most of them knew nothing about the things that are shown in this movie. Um, Hostels, that was out last year. Um, the Native American newspapers and websites that are out there really liked this. They said it was a very good representation. And it's as much about what it is to be a human being, whether you're white or Indian or black or anything else, about being a real human being as anything. Um, it's, a, it's a great work. So here's some other ones. Um, Frozen River isn't directly about Native Americans, but um, they're part of the story and the depiction there is excellent um, of the communities, of their values. Um, some other ones. My favorite going way back is Little Big Man with Dustin Hoffman. And yes, this is Hollywood, it's not, a direct representation, it's kind of a crazy story, but Vine Deloria Jr. says it represents, um, it, it shows well how the Native American thinks. Otherwise I wouldn't have put it on the list. But very entertaining, old classic movie. Um, so here's some other things for you to think about. Um, and one other thing, I wish I could have showed this, but it's a half hour long. Um, MTV did an episode called um, Native America, Seventh Generation Rising, about Native American young people, musicians, um, and their work. And uh, they had a long list of an editorial board who guided this episode so that it was, in fact, Native Americans speaking about themselves. And um, there's a rapper named Frank Walm, who um, is also a social justice activist. Um, there's a wonderful woman, Inez Jasper. She's a Canadian indigenous woman, um, and she uses her music to heal. And her activist issue is um, how many Native American women disappear and are trafficked. And she's doing that work. So it's very inspiring just seeing how the young people um, really care about justice in the world, um, want to help their own people heal, and want to see everyone healed. They really do understand the connectedness that we all have. They, that is built into their, um, their worldview and their understanding. We need to learn from the indigenous communities. So, um, so I've got some topics there that you can also look at. Learn about the native, uh, the American Indian movement. That, in the 1970s, was kind of a parallel civil rights uprising among the Native American uh, communities. Um, so I'm gonna end with um, the conclusion I came to in my work, and that was that weeping can serve as a sign. Um, a sign that blindness, our own blindness, not just colored blindness, our blindness to ourself, um, that it's under correction, that suffering has been in um, any sufficient way that, we've re that we have done the work of remembering. Um, tears can signify that we have s we're set upon the path to our own healing. Um, and only after individuals and communities weep over the suffering of others by which they have received their good lives will those persons be prepared to move toward reconcil reconciling themselves with the past? This is really big. Um, and it's a separate work, but what do we do with the fact that those of us who are identified outside as white are just handed 
a lot of privilege, a lot of things are easier for us. Um, and our easier lives, and I'm speaking this as a person who grew up very poor, but boy, my life would have been even harder if I had not had white skin. Um, so, we have to understand that, that this was built, our good lives are built on the backs of the suffering of other peoples, Native Americans and African American slaves. We have to see this, and we can't just have it Every book out there, everything I read about um, overcoming racism acknowledges that, and it's like they've got a quick blurb about that. And it's usually a fast blurb about Native American taking their land, blah, blah, blah. We've got to go in deep. We've got to go in deep. Um, those persons must confront the privilege that they enjoy that was bought, and this is from liberation th theology, with the crucifixion of a people estranged from them because of violence and trauma to the families, and it continues into the present. The prophet Jeremiah wrote the book of Lamentations. He says, for these things I weep, my eyes flow with tears. For a comforter is far from me, one to re revive my courage. My children are desolate. The enemy has prevailed. Lament means to just sit and, and let ourselves be aware of how horrible something is, and then move on from it. We don't want to sit and dwell in it. Um, I know this is sort of depressing. <laughs> I'm looking at faces and they're going, wow. But you know, this, there's no way around this. Our country has some real deep division, and this is part of it, and there's no way around this. It's come of age, and we've got to do this work. We have to do this work now. So I'm going to leave with that. Um, Dennis Banks, one of the heroes of the American Indian Movement, um, who just died two years ago. Um, not doing anything is never an option. So let's listen to, to the voices of Native Americans. Um, the struggle for decency will never end. The struggle for justice will never end. The drumbeat of our people will never stop. Um, so we can choose to be a part of that, um, but, we, but it's not going to be fun, it's not going to be easy. Got to be brave. That's all. So thank you, Dr. Lang, for um, really causing us to listen. And so I hope that we are all personally challenged to think about um, Native voices in a way that perhaps we were not before we came into the room today. I started off by saying many of us make up our own stories to try to have this connection to a group of people that we don't normally have a true bloodline or cultural connection to. But hopefully as a result of this presentation and the resources that have been presented to us, we will now have a means for trying to listen to and find the voice of a people that we should owe so much gratitude to in terms of who we are able to be today. So thank you for that. Um, really quick, are there any questions that you have for Dr. Lang? If there are questions um, that people want to do kind of as a group, if you would like to also interact with her personally, you have the opportunity to do so. We just have some cookies and um, lemonade as we want to continue to have the discussion. But if anybody has questions, she is available to do Q&A. Um, I do have, um, back on the table, I have two sets of cards. One is my business card, the other is um, a card with the address of the blog that I do. I, I, there's not a lot on there right now um, because I've been very busy, but um, that's where I'm gonna post this. If you're interested in just beginning some of your own personal, you know, informal research, if you just say, I wanna read one book about a Native American, um, one book of history, or I'm interested in this particular issue, um, to start you on your way. So that will be there on the blog. So there's little cards over there. You'll see the blackbird. So, any questions? Okay, thank you for listening. Oh, yes, Carolyn. Japanese internment camps during World War II, 
three thoughts buzzing around while you were talking. <laughs> um, but yeah, the, um, the Wounded Knee Massacre um, is something that is ever present in the um, minds of Native American communities. Um, it was a response to the ghost dance. If you understand what that whole movement was during the Indian Wars, so many um, you know, from Native American communities had lost their families, and um, and it was it was a ritual, and it was very powerful, and it was giving the people hope, and uh, and it scared the United States officials. Um, so the you um, the massacre was carried out by um, the U.S. Army, and. Um, but just to say that there is hope, that there are, I believe people's hearts out there are opening up. Um, and one of my sources was a video of the men who are in the same um, army unit that committed the massacre came before the tribal elders and asked for their forgiveness. They kneeled in front of them. And as a representative of that army unit that did the dirty work there, um, they asked forgiveness. Uh, it was very beautiful. It'll make you cry just watching that. Um, so we, ha we have to do that. Um, and whatever our little part is. Um, but the glossing over is very dangerous. There's um, uh, one of the representatives, um, and his name is, his first name is Mark, I believe, I can't remember, from Oklahoma. He's done a lot of work as far as getting legislation that's helping um, the tribes in Oklahoma. Um, but of course, he's doing what politicians do, wheeling and dealing, and I guess compromising, you would say. And last week, he made a reference to um, his family came from the Cherokee Nation in the east, walked the Trail of Tears. They were moved out of their land. Um, the Supreme Court of the United States said they are a nation. They fit the description. They have a government. They have codes. They're a nation. They get to stay. Um, and Andrew Jackson said, no, um, enforce your decision. Mr. Marshall. So, hence the Trail of Tears began, and this um, representative referred to it as the volunteer walk. Now, he's popular among the Native people because he's getting a lot done as far as the legislation that, that they need, and yet, where did that come from? Where did that come from? And his family, as he says, you know, stopped and still lives where they ended their volunteer walk. So, um, yeah, we really have to cut through, um, cut through the lies right now and really, really be vigilant um, for truth and the truth of history. Um, so that's what I'm recommending. That's what I'm asking you to do. Be brave. Um, be brave in your heart and go read and study and learn. Um, if you have the opportunity, go meet some Native American communities. Um, I know uh, 
We kind of ran them out of Pennsylvania. There's not even a, a piece of land that's a reservation here. Um, but the communities are here. They're, they're everywhere. Um, so seek that out and educate yourself with an open heart. Um, and if it feels bad, and if you're dealing, you know, not just Native American history, but the whole racism issue, you know, it's going to feel uncomfortable. Let it feel uncomfortable. Let it feel uncomfortable. And then get past that. Ask yourself what you got to do to get past it. Um, what I thought when you were um, speaking was, um, I think a parallel to the wounded knee um, remembrance is the lynching memorial that has just been built. This is doing this work of reminding us of putting these very hard things in front of our eyes. Um, I haven't been there yet, but it's on my list. Um, I, you know, if you make a trip, if you plan a trip, I'll come along. Um, it, it's something we have to do. Um, and so one of my recommendations for larger culture um, would be um, a wounded knee remembrance day. Now, of course, that would need to be established within, from, from the um, tribal communities themselves, but I'm on board for that. I think December 29th, we should all stop and remember that, you know, the, the life in America we, we enjoy was at a great cost, and we disrupted and traumatized and murdered peoples, whole peoples, in order to set this all up. Um, they didn't just disappear. That's a myth. Um, and we didn't just push into the West. It was violent. Okay, so this is the stuff. And so that, that's what I'm asking. Just be brave. Okay, anything else? I thank you for, for your attention. <laughs>